Say again. Dobro došli. Dobro došli. And then to follow up, Yasam Hervat. No, no, that's not correct, or no, I'm not. <laughs> oh, but the reason I said this is uh, my, my name is Sandy Lydon, I teach at Cabrillo College. Um, and, and feel a modest amount of responsibility for what's happening here today. Um, you got to be careful what you tell your students um, and over and over and over again. Um, but I teach at Cabrillo and I, you know, on St. Patrick's Day, everybody's Irish. Well, today, here in this room, everybody's Croatian. Yeah. <laughs> And for, and for many of you, you didn't even know what that was. And that's why we have this book. That's why this book exists. So that by the time you, many of you have had time actually to read the whole book in line. Um, and so we have a deal. You can actually trade the book back in and get your money back because you've already read it uh, on, on the way. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, and speaking of lines, I have, uh, there are some details we need to take care of for sure. One is you were given a number. Um, it's kind of like the lottery. Uh, some of you received the number while you were in line. D they are hoping that you'll you know, pay attention to that number and line up in that order to be fair. 
um, afterwards because they'll be signing books until the, the end of time, or <laughs> till Easter, right? Till Easter. Um, one of the things they didn't know, when you do these things, your handwriting alters considerably over time. Um, and when they go in now to get the safe deposit box and there's that signature card, their signature is not going to match that signature on the signature card at all. But trust me, I, it, it's happened in the, in the past. Second thing, um, if you haven't purchased a book, the, the special deal is on today uh, here. Um, if you go to a bookstore, it's going to be oh, much more expensive. Um, so, so you want to you want to catch the deal while you can, um, and also um, there will be coffee and dessert um, afterward. Um, compliments of Sako, so uh, the organization uh, that's been very supportive of this whole um, this whole project. Um, th this the Capitola Book Company. Um, God, what is it? Twenty something years ago now. Um, this is the last the most recent of a series of books um, which the book company has done. Um, and the purpose of the book company basically is to, to illuminate uh, groups and themes that may not otherwise uh, be known. Uh, we actually started out with the Chinese book that I did, um, which now seems a million years ago, um, and the Japanese. And, and one of the things that, that I think is really important is that a lot of people say, well, why are you always doing all these books about separate people? Well. Because until we develop the stories of the, I call them the threads, the tapestry of the Pajaro Valley, until we develop those threads, we really won't be able to see the weave of the tapestry as it really is. So each needs to be done. And then ultimately we'll have the material from which we can then build the final tapestry and everybody will be, uh, will be included. We're, we're talking about inclusion here and that's really what we're about. And the Capitola Book Company, um, and thanks very much to George Al and the, the Al family, George is here. Uh, wave your hand, George, wave your hand. Um, none, of, none of this, none of this would happen uh, without, without George's support. Uh, and while I'm, I'm thinking of it, just to make sure, um, the designer, uh, the lead designer of all of our lovely books. This one, uh, Chinatron Dreams, that we did about uh, George Lee's photography. It's a wonderful book, uh, gorgeous design. Um, all of this is done by our designer extraordinaire, Mark Ong. Mark, put, put up your hand. <clears throat> Mark. Um, and the book, the publication in this event would not uh, have occurred without the support of the Barina Foundation, um, along with the Owl family. And to the Barina Foundation, thank you very much. They know who they are out there. Um, thank you. Um, the book has been dedicated to Andrew Meckes um, and his parents, uh, Marco Meckes and Kate Korich Meckes. And uh, Andy, if you uh, want to put your hand up, Andy, Andrew Meckes, right here. And, and what I was thinking that what we would do is have everybody who's not related to the Meccases stand up, because that'd be a smaller group. Um, but, but to do it straight, would all of you who are related by marriage or in any other way uh, or by blood to the, to the Meccas, um, uh, empire, um, please stand up. Let's let's see who you are. Come on, there we go. Oh, a smaller group. Wow. There, there are people, people who aren't, who aren't acknowledging it for some reason. I'm not sure why that is, <laughs> but I'm sure we'll we'll find out momentarily. Um, so, I. Just one, one thing, and then, and then we'll go. And the one thing has to do with what I think this should become. Um, and it already is, I know, for a lot of you. Um, for many of the people who are now second, third, fourth generation America born, um, this is going to make your life easier. Because you won't have to sit down at the knee of, uh, beside the fireplace. Nobody sits down beside the fireplace anyway, uh, anymore. But if uh, at the computer mon monitor, and explain to the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren all that has come before um, and from whence their, um, their community has derived. This is it. 
you can, this is kind of like the historic Croatian phone book. Um, you'll be able to find pretty much everybody here. Um, they've made a tremendous effort to be inclusive. Um, but it, it, it sets a benchmark. Bam, there it is. Um, the story of the vertical integration of the Apple industry is worth the price of admission, folks. This, this is a brilliant thing here. This is not just a, 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 you know, about all the families. It's also about how the community was able to find a niche and then actually create one um, and do some really astounding things very early on in California agriculture. This is, this is for the ag history people in this room, this is a, this is a monster because this will tell you how that all happened um, and why you're too late. <laughs> just too late. So I want to, I want to finally, um, oh, I want to blow a kiss. Um, I, I, to me, she's the godmother of this whole thing. Um, and that is Ann Soldo, who's uh, sitting in the back. Dear Ann Soldo, God bless you. The radio program, the music, the things that they did to keep this thing going until finally, you know, you guys got your act together and were able, <laughs> were able to do it. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Catherine and Donna. Um, my contact is more intimate with Donna in that Donna was a student of mine a million years ago. Um, and um, I did say to her one time, I said, you know, because I tried. And even with Ann Soldo's help, I, I, um, I didn't feel comfortable. People, I just wasn't part of the game. And um, so I finally thought, well, no, I just better go do somebody else, um, and did. And, but in the meantime, I said to Donna, who was in my class, and she'd written a paper, and I said, you've got it. You've got the, the, the insights, um, um, the, the lamb recipes, uh, the things that are really important. Um, <laughs> why all of these people are going to the Coralitas Sausage Factory on weekends, um, and, and who better? So I would like to introduce, and there, I don't know how you're going to do this, but I'm sure you'll do it well, um, Donna and Catherine. So I'm going to say Dobro Doshli the correct way. <laughs> Welcome to family and friends. Um, I want to start by saying that my sister and I are both so grateful that you're here this afternoon to help us celebrate the publication of our book. We've really been quite overwhelmed with the response. We're here this afternoon to tell you a story. For those of you here who are Croatian Americans, there is much of this story that you may or may not already know. Different people know different parts of the story. And our younger generation and those outside of our community know very little. What we've attempted to do in this book is to piece the story together as a gift to all of you and to our larger community. So, talking about how the book came about, you've heard bits and pieces, and I, and I just am going to go over that again one more time. I, as a student of Sandy Leiden's in 1980, I did write a paper on my family's Croatian background, and, and it was literally almost 30 years ago, and over the years, I've seen him socially, I've seen him at different events, and he would always nudge me and say, Donna, you need to write the Croatian story. Someone's got to write the Croatian story. And I kept hearing that over and over again. And then um, another thing happened, I was at my brother Paul's wedding, who's here today, and several of the old timers who were there that day said, you know, the story's going to be gone. It's going to be gone. And it kept, you know, kind of eating away at me, and I kept thinking about it. So finally, there was a dinner five and a half years ago. Um, we were with George Al Jr. and his wife Gail, who are also here today. And uh, Kathy and I were both at that dinner, and, and Kathy's husband, Marshall, as well. And George said to us, if you write the book, I'll publish it. And then my husband said, if you write the book, I'll edit it. And then my sister said, if you want to work on this, I'll help you. How do you say no to that? <laughs> so, you know, we started on a long journey, um, and at first we thought, you know, it would be a little pamphlet. You know, we didn't know what it was going to be like, but that's where we started. And uh, it's now five and a half years later, and it's, turned, it's just grown and grown and grown. So I want to thank both Sandy Leiden and George Al Jr. for instigating this project.
For the past five and a half years, Catherine and I have been researching and writing. We've accessed over 200 sources, both here and in Croatia, and we've interviewed over 30 people, many of whom are here this afternoon. So what's in the book? Um, it starts in the place where it all started. We go back to Dubrovnik. We go back to the Dubrovnik region, um, and we do a whole chapter on, on the history of that area. We then tell why the Croatians left and why they came to California. It describes their early economic development in San Francisco in the 1850s and how they got to Watsonville. Catherine then tells the story of the economic development of the apple industry in Watsonville between 1876 and 1910. We follow that with a chapter on the early leaders of the community and then the Croatian cultural life in Watsonville in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Our final chapter is titled Becoming American on second and third generation Croatians in Watsonville. It's important for us to say that it would have been impossible to include every Croatian family and to tell every Croatian story in one book. What we're hoping is that this book will stimulate a better understanding of this story and new interest in our Croatian history and the history of this valley. Toward that goal, we've developed a website. Our website is blossomsintogold.com, and it's tucked into your books. All of you who bought books today or going to later, um, there's a bookmark in there with our website. And you can order books through our website. You can actually go online and order them, but also we've made it so that you can write to us. And if any of you have comments about the book or additional stories or memories that you'd like to share, we want, them, we want you to send them to us. Write us, tell us your stories. If you do, we'll make sure that copies are preserved at the Pajaro Valley Historical Association. If you don't have a computer, ask your children or grandchildren to help you with this project. <laughs> now, my sister Catherine is going to continue with a few more thank yous. I'd like to welcome all of you as well, and, and thanks for coming today. In particular, I'd like to thank poet Morton Marcus, Donna's husband, and our editor. He believed in us. He shared our joy in this project. His lifelong love of the written word was our filter before presenting this story to you. There are so many individuals and groups who helped make today possible. Mark Ong, philosopher and writer in his own right, our book designer, took our story and the photographs that so many of you here shared and captured the spirit of a community. It's a beautiful book. Thank you, Mark. Former, <laughs> former Watsonville Mayor Ann Soldo, former Woman of the Year Nita Gizdich, both of whom have worn among their many hats the role of spokespersons for the Watsonville Croatian community, both generously gave of their time and guided us on the right track at the beginning of our research. SACO, the Slavic American Cultural Organization, thank you for your enthusiasm. Thank you for the desserts that wait, us out, wait for us out in the lobby. But most of all, thank you for your determination to keep the Croatian culture alive to share with your children and grandchildren. And we need to thank those of you who allowed us into your homes for interviews. You shared pictures, documents, memories. Thank you for remembering. Pat Johns at the Agricultural History Project opened the community's historical agricultural archives to us. Tom Ninkovic allowed us access to his ongoing database of Watsonville Croatians. Jane Board, Lou Arbanis, from the uh, Pajaro Valley Historical Association. What a treasure this community has in them. If you want your stories, artifacts, pictures of your parents' time to be available to your grandchildren and held in the community's collective memory, the PVHA is your legacy. Thanks, Lou. And Donna? I'm going to continue on that theme that, Stan that Sandy Lydon started a few minutes ago about the thread in the tapestry. As we learn more about the history of the Pajaro Valley, we begin to piece together a giant quilt, a quilt of many colors and fabrics. 
The first piece of the fabric was obtained through the writings of the Spanish missionaries in the late 18th and early 19th century. Father Junipero Serra wrote about the California Indian population in this area and the earliest settlers from Spain. Fabric was added to the quilt by Ed Martin, who wrote about Watsonville in the 1870s, and by the late Betty Lewis, whose histories of Watsonville were published 100 years later in the 1970s. Sandy Lydon added another square of fabric in 1985 with his important history of the Chinese in the Monterey Bay region. Also in the 1980s, more color was added to the quilt when the Filipino community was documented by Jeff Tagami and Shirley Anchetta in beautifully written poems and by Jeffrey Dunn, who wrote and directed the film Dollar a Day, Ten Cents a Dance. In 1997, Sandy Lydon added one more square to the quilt when he brought us the story of the Japanese families of this region. This afternoon, my sister Catherine and I are hoping to add yet another piece of cloth to this ever-growing and richly colored quilt with the story of Watsonville's Croatians. So let's start the slide presentation by talking about those buildings on Main Street. The Latinich building, as I think most of you know, is on the corner of Main and Beach Streets. I think just about everybody recognizes it. It was built in 1914 by M. N. Letnich and his cousin Matteo, both from Konavle, Croatia. Another landmark building, the Resitar Hotel, on the corner of Main and West Lake, was built in 1927 by three of the four Resitar brothers who came to Watsonville they were also from Konavle. So who were these guys? And how is it that they came from Croatia to Watsonville? And where did they get the money to build these buildings? We're going to start by going back. A map of Croatia for those of you who are not familiar. And I'm going to use my pointer here. So we've got the boot of Italy. We've got the Adriatic Sea on the east of Italy. And the red lined country is the country of Croatia. And just at the very, very southern tip, we have the city and the region of Dubrovnik. Dubrovnik isn't just a city. It's a geographic region which surrounds the city. It's, it's a small region, 75 miles long and 20 miles wide. It also includes the coastal islands along this portion of the Adriatic coast. The Dubrovnik region has approximately the same boundaries as it had when Dubrovnik was a republic. And here's what this region looks like. This is kind of a complicated map, but I'm going to show you a little bit. I want you to follow the, my, my red line here. This dark black line shows you the boundaries of the former Dubrovnik Republic. But for those of you in the audience who are Brachini, the island of Brach up here and Var and Korchula were all part of the Republic for a period of time. So what we're really looking at here is this entire map. This is where Watsonville Watsonville's Croatians came from, is from this region. It's important to give you some historical background on this region to help understand um, how everything happened in Watsonville in later days. So I'm going to move, this is a 17th century painting of the city of Dubrovnik. It shows you what Dubrovnik would have looked like in the 1600s. It was a very important international trading center and an independent city-state called the Dubrovnik Republic. This republic lasted for 700 years, from 1100 to 1808. And I want to show you, right down the center, this is the main street of Dubrovnik, right here, cutting through from west to east. It's called the Stradon, and we've got the Franciscan Monastery right here on the left-hand side, because we're going to come back to that in a slide in a few more minutes. So this is Dubrovnik today. And it doesn't look a whole lot different from the 17th century painting. This shot is a shot from the town walls. And now we're looking down the Straden, the, the main street in town right here, again with the, the Franciscan monastery on the left. So a view from the town walls. By 1272, this republic developed its own laws. This is a photograph of the original Book of Laws from the Dubrovnik Archive. I was allowed to take this photograph this past summer. Dubrovnik was well known throughout Europe for its democratic government, organization, and diplomacy. 
Relations between the Ottoman Empire and Dubrovnik were interesting. In 1373, Pope Gregory IX gave Dubrovnik permission to trade with the Ottoman Turks. This created a link between East and West, and Dubrovnik became a wealthy international trading center. The tradesmen honed their skills and were the middlemen delivering goods between the Western world and the Ottoman Empire. At the same time, other Christian countries were not allowed to trade with the Muslim world. So what this is, is a rare photograph of the first demand for tribute from Mehmet II of the Ottoman Empire to Dubrovnik in 1458, five years after the fall of Constantinople. The Dubrovnik Republic was never invaded or militarily controlled by the Ottoman Empire. Dubrovnik's international shipping fleet boasted 300 ships in the 1500s, rivaling Venice in shipping throughout Europe. 18 of their ships were part of the Spanish Armada. Between 1200 and 1800, Dubrovnik was a very diverse, cosmopolitan port city. There were people doing business from all over the world and speaking many languages. In his play Twelfth Night, Shakespeare describes Dubrovnik as the ideal city-state. Most of Watsonville's Croatians came from the rural areas and the islands of the Dubrovnik Republic. The majority came from Konavli, and this is what Konavli looks like today. This next slide, this is a painting dated around 1900, showing people from Konavli wearing their traditional dress and dancing the kolo, a traditional round dance. And I want you to notice the similarities between the dresses that you're seeing up on, up, uh, on the slide with the, the mannequin that we have here with us today. It's, it's basically the same clothing. This dress be, belonged to our great aunt, Kate Mijatovic Korac, and she would have worn this dress in the 1920s in Croatia. The next slide, this is a traditional family house in Konavli. This is the Banats house. And one of the things I want you to notice about this is the architecture. Um, this is their pyramid-shaped chimneys called kominatas, and they're built above the kitchen hearse in this house. And there's another one back here in the back. And it's a very common, um, uh, it's common architecture for the Konavli region. By the way, that's, this is um, Anton Buskovic right here, <laughs> walking in front of his house. But I want to point out something else unique about this slide. I want you to notice how large this house is. And one of the unique cultural traits of this area was that the rural people had for centuries lived in large family communities called Zajednica. These large families included up to 20 family members and they developed very strict roles for each individual's responsibility and behavior. These large family units had organized for survival and they worked together as a single social unit. The Zajednica would prove to be extremely important for the Croatians' economic ses success in the Pajaro Valley. Then, in 1808, this republic, with all of its government, laws, and history, comes to an end. Napoleon's troops, as part of his invasion of European countries, enter Dubrovnik and take over the city and destroy the republic. So now we're going to fast forward. We're going to jump. So this is 1808. I'm going to tell you that the immigrants start arriving in San Francisco in 1850. So I want to tell you what's happening in those 38, there's only 38 years there. The Republic has been demolished. Their shipping trade has been destroyed. The shipbuilders on the islands and the farmers in the countryside are starving to death. People hear news of gold in California. Hundreds of boys and young men begin migrating to California. Most between the ages of 16 and 20 and they speak no English. More than half of the young male population left the villages of the Dubrovnik region and immigrated to America, with many settling in the Pajaro Valley. Here are some who left. These are the Alaga men, and this photograph was taken in 1905. This is in Bani, Konavli, and it shows you the traditional dress of the time. Seven of these men would leave for Watsonville. And there were some who were left behind. This is Anton Resetar from Chilipi, Konavli. Four of his sons would leave for Watsonville and later build the Resetar Hotel. Oops, back. This is Anton's oldest son, also named Anton. 
This is Resitar. He was the first of the Resitar sons to come to Watsonville in 1902, but he returned to Chilope to care for his ailing father, the man we just saw on the last slide. In 1927, he returned to Watsonville, joining his three younger brothers, and he arrived with his wife, Pauline, who you can see there in, in the photograph, and three of his children. He, they arrived just in time for the Resitar Hotel as it was opening. But I also want to point out that this is a young Jerry Resitar right here, and Jerry's wife, Gloria, is in our audience this afternoon. This is a shot of immigrants leaving an island just off of Dubrovnik. They're e leaving the island of Kolachep. It's 1910, and they're heading for America. Like everyone else, the Croatians came to California in large numbers with the gold rush. And this is a shot of the San Francisco Harbor in 1851. By 1850, there was a small Croatian community in San Francisco on Davis Street. Many of them came and stayed, but some of them didn't. So I want to tell you a story, the story of Pero Miljanic. In Croatian, it would be pronounced Pero Miljanic. In the 1860s, he was the member of the crew on a ship that sailed from Konavli to New Orleans. Once in New Orleans, he jumped ship and took off across the plains in the middle of winter, heading for the Sierra Nevada. He's one, however, who didn't stay in California. After making some money, he returned to Konavli. For years afterward, he would instruct the children of his small village. With a stick, he would draw a map of California in the dirt. He then told them that when they grew up, that's where they should go. One of those children was George Miljanich Sr., the father of Watsonville's three Miljanich brothers, Peter, Paul, and George. By 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad connects from e the East Coast to California, so it's now far easier to cross the country. By 1870, there are 250 Croatians living in San Francisco. Some Croatian men found work in the mines, but far more found opportunities in the service industries, where they formed partnerships and worked in groups. They worked in the restaurant industry, the coffee houses, and as fruit merchants. Some of you may be familiar with one of these early San Francisco Croatians. This is John Tadic. He was one of the early owners of the historic Tadic Grill, the oldest restaurant in San Francisco. In 1871, Tadic traveled from the island of Var in Croatia to New York. He then rode the Transcontinental Railroad from New York to California less than two years after its opening. So this is what he said about that trip that he took in 1871. I shall never forget the beautiful scenery, and I am happy that I had the opportunity to see the country as it was then. I can never see again those wonderful sights under the same conditions and I feel it was a great privilege. I recall now that whenever our train would stop on a sidetrack, hundreds of Indians and their squaws with papooses on their backs would gather around the train. They were just as curious about us as we were about them. And another, another interesting thing to me was my first sight of a group of Chinese. They had on large sun hats and were repairing the railroad bed. The sight of the Indians and the Chinese made a lasting impression and I enjoy the recollection to this day. Two other extremely entrepreneurial Croatians who lived in this early San Francisco colony were Luke Srezovic, the man who's up on the screen right now. He was from the island of Lopud, and Marko Rabasa from Janjina Pelyashats. They had both experienced San Francisco's economic explosion in the late 1860s. And by 1876, Marco Rabasa and Luke Srezovic are doing business in Watsonville. This is what Watsonville would have looked like to them at the time they arrived. When they arrived, there were 47,000 fruit trees in Santa Cruz County, and 20 years later, by 1891, there would be 307,000 fruit trees in Santa Cruz County. 20 years after that, by 1920, Croatians would make up more than 20% of Watsonville's population. And my sister Catherine is now going to explain how that came about. So when you hear references to Croatians or Slavonians of 100 years ago, it's usually in connection with apples. 
And so it became part of our journey in putting together this book to better understand what was the connection between Croatians, apples, and the growth of this community. To do that, we're going to take one more look back to Dubrovnik Harbor to remember that Croatians came with a cultural heritage as traders. And although it had been a generation since Napoleon's forces had uh, destroyed the shipping and all, and all the ships in Dubrovnik Harbor, when they arrived in San Francisco and saw this bustling harbor, they saw it as their opportunity to reestablish what they had lost. And so, as Donna had said, Croatians were far more likely to find their opportunity in providing goods and services and trading in San Francisco than in finding gold in the Sierra foothills. And by the 1870s, that stretch to provide goods and services to San Francisco reached all the way to Watsonville. And here we have um, Watsonville in the 1870s with our board sidewalks on Main Street. And just as a, a point of reference, Watsonville at that time is about 20 years old. The population has grown from about 50 in the time of the ranchos to about 2,000 people. And that gr the grazing land of the ranchos has been put in agricultural use. There's 4.5 million tons of wheat and barley and oats and potatoes and beans being shipped out of Watsonville annually by the 1870s. But little fresh produce has made its way out. It would be, uh, it would be a group of early Croatian distributors that would change that. And Donna talked about Marco Rabasa and Luke Srezovic. And this is M. N. Letnich and his cousin Matteo Letnich and the Scourge brothers, Luke and Stephen. It would be this handful of Croatian distributors and, and a few more who would look at the Paro Valley and realize that they could provide to San Francisco all the produce that was grown here. And so it became their mission to increase production in the Pajaro Valley. And to do that, they set up some rather unorthodox practices in the handling of fruit at that time. They realized that if they went to the family farmers that were here and promised to buy everything that they could grow, that those farmers would have the, the confidence and the financial incentive to plant more trees. Well, pre-purchase pre contracts had been used before for grain or for sugar beets, but it appears to be unique among the Croatians to offer a form of a future contract for fruit before um, it had even been grown. In fact, these um, early distributors would go into the orchards, and this orchard is um, below the Mount Madonna Hills here, and we see it in blossom. And the early distributors would go into orchards like this in blossom, and by looking at um, the configuration of the blossoms, they would offer a specific price to the grower for that year's crop before they'd even seen the fruit. And then they took it a step farther, a, a riskier level. Um, Marco Rabasa went into an orchard and offered a specific price for the fruit for the next eight years. Well, the Pajaronian goes crazy. It, it's going, the, this risk is too high. No one can do business this way. And I have to say that today, as any of you in business know, you would never offer a price for fresh produce for the next eight years. But the practice worked, and orchards and production increased really quickly. And now we've got a postcard from home. This, this is the Straden in Dubrovnik, and it's a postcard to Watsonville at the turn of the century. The postcards and letters were going back and forth in the decades before the turn of the century. They're going back, back and forth constantly. And as the orchards are growing rapidly, 
It's just as laws get passed to restrict Chinese labor. And so the letters home start to talk about jobs here in Watsonville. And in fact, offering extended family and old neighbors a job here becomes a common practice. Luke Sikuth, talking of his youth in the Konavli Valley before the turn of the century, remembered, I heard about California. That was all you heard about back home. They'd been writing back and forth. As far as the United States, we hardly ever thought about it. But California was always on our minds. <laughs> and so encouraging immigration was so successful that when Don and I talked with Nena Dekarich, noted historian in Dubrovnik a few years ago, he talked about this time before the turn of the century with a lot of emotion. It was like it was yesterday, and that's when we realized that half the boys and young men from all the villages throughout this region left for California, and it felt to those back home that they were lost to them. And now we have this great photograph of the Stolich family and their pickers. And I love this photo because you have the sense that everyone in the family is involved, from the children right through to grandma. And that was indeed the case, just as it had been in the old country, where everyone had a job in order to ensure the family's economic survival. And organizing and packing in the same place where the picking was occurred was a brand new practice. It turned out to be a really good one because more fruit made it in good condition to San Francisco, there were more jobs in Watsonville, and more money stayed in the community. Whoops, too fast. Here we've got um, immigrant Croatian laborers. This time they're in an apricot tree. Just as a reminder, as these distributors are sending fruit to San Francisco, it's not just apples, it's everything. It's going to San Francisco. And um, it also show us, shows us that the Croatian workforce expanded really rapidly, especially when it became clear that a single man living frugally could save enough in just a few years to lease his own small orchard or set up his own packing business. And most of these immigrants tried one, the other, or both. Here we have the Vlauten and Vojvodic packing company. So from the late 1880s through to the mid-1920s, when Croatian's immigration was restricted by new laws, each year brought new arrivals. And within a couple years after that, each year brought new packing businesses or new orchards. For example, the first packing house was 1884, Luke Srezovic, and the second, the Letnich packing house in 1885. And then there were three, and then four, and then nine, and then 20, and then 50, and more than 80 Croatian families pooled their resources and followed the example of someone who had set up just a few years before them to set up a packing business. The packing businesses became larger and more organized. Here we've got an early Olga Brothers packing business looking very official. And it really was developing a method of organized distribution that brought perishable agriculture into the industrial age. Oh, and this is, this is a great photo. This is from the 1930s. It's um, a little bit later than the period that I've been talking about but it is an example of a practice among the Croatians that occurred right from the beginning. Um, when a family outgrew the little packing operation they had behind their home, and they, and they wanted a more industrialized setup, they didn't set up just anywhere. They set up right next to their neighbor. And so if you can't read from the back of the room, we've got Stolic, Jupan, Urinich, Kalich, Lukrich, Letnich, Borkovic, Dragovic, Brykovic, all in a row, everybody together. Oh, and now we've got the packing houses became a center of Croatian life. They're used after hours as well. 
And this one's really fun. You can almost imagine being there and how this was set up with the apple boxes all moved to the back of the room and the streamers put up. And um, we've got apple boxes here turned on end with the planks set down. So we've turned workspace into wedding supper for the Secondo family. And William Volk in his lab here in Watsonville. Now, the Croatians wrote purchase contracts in order to expand orchard production. And they brought over extended family in order to have enough labor to keep up with those trees. And they organized the, the packing and every step it took to get the apples from tree to grocer's bin um, in another city. They increased production 40 or 50 fold by the turn of the century. But what they couldn't do with tar or whale oil soap or elixirs that burned the leaves off of trees was cut the 50% toll that insects took in each year's crop. It would take this man, William Volk, and his partner, E.E. E. Luther, both entomology students on loan from UC Davis, and it would take them years, but they were able to develop a compound and a system that was effective, yet gentle enough, to be routinely sprayed. And the outcome for Volk and Luther was the development of the ortho brand right here in Watsonville, and the outcome for the apple distributors was an escalation in production again, enough to provide for a major portion of this country and beyond. This is an apple annual photo. Um, apple annual, if some of you don't know, was um, a regional fair that was held here in Watsonville between 1910 and 1913. It was um, very successful. And this is Main Street. And, and this photo, mirrors just a, a portion of the apple wagons that one would see rumbling down Walker Street daily all day long during harvest season. And here we've got another apple annual photo. This is such a great photo. Look at the mission. It's um, made all of apples and, and, and the roof is apples and the world is apples. And then you realize these are folding chairs back here. And it gives you a whole new sense of the scope of this display. But it's also a reflection of the scope of the thinking and the endeavor that the early Croatian people took on. With their heritage and trade, they took for granted, of course, they could build this distant hinterland into a nationally known fruit district. And now I'm going to turn back over to Donna, who's going to talk about community life and customs in the Croatian con community here in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. For the last two chapters of the book, we interviewed more than 30 people, many of whom were senior members of Watsonville's Croatian community, the children and grandchildren of the immigrants. Here's a map, and I'm hoping it's, bl yeah, it's blown up really quite nicely here. This is a, an old fire insurance map of, of Watsonville, and I'm going to use my red marker again. This is Main Street, and we're going to be going south to north. This is Main Street. We have St. Patrick's Church right up here on the left. And if you just go down Ford Street, you're going to see this area that's marked from Ford down Rodriguez, all the way down to First, and then back up Walker. And this is the area where there was the highest concentration of Croatians living from 1900 into, in, into the 1940s. That doesn't mean that there weren't Croatians living all over Watsonville and all over Pajaro Valley, but this is where the concentrated area was. And the advantage of living so close together was that it facilitated the continual social visiting that was a part of Croatian culture in the old country. For those of you who grew up in this community, you know that everyone was pretty self-sufficient. They all grew their own gardens, raised chickens and rabbits, and they often had a goat or a pig. But this same closeness is also why everyone knew everyone else's business. So keeping your good name became essential. George Miljanic told us the following story from his childhood. He said, when I was a kid, 
My father used to say, if you get your name in the paper because you've done something bad, you'll find your suitcase waiting for you on the front porch. <laughs> in the Croatian community, your reputation was everything. But as a kid, George kept thinking, we don't even own a suitcase. <laughs> Where are my parents going to get this suitcase if I were to get into trouble? So, moving on, here's a slide of the plaza, which I'm sure most of you recognize, but you're going to see something unusual unless you're a historian or you know a lot about Watsonville history. What have we got? We've got the mansion house, yes? The mansion house right on the corner of Main and Beach Streets. It's there because this mansion house was moved north on Main Street by the two Letnich cousins, Matteo and Amen, when they decided to come along and build their Letnich building, which I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. They actually picked this mansion house up and moved it north in order to have the corner for themselves. So, okay, so this is 1900 that we're looking at this photograph before that took place, which was 1914. But I want to tell you a story about this plaza. Watsonville has always been a culturally diverse community. Large numbers of workers have been necessary to maintain its ranching, orchard, and farming industries. One of the people we interviewed before she passed away was Mary Ferris. As many of you know, Mary was the granddaughter of Luke Skurich, one of Watsonville's earliest Croatian immigrants. This is her memory of the plaza. Watsonville has always been a diverse town. In the 1930s, when I was a young girl, my grandfather Luke would walk with me from our house to the plaza on Main Street. We would sit there on a park bench, and my grandfather would point out all of the languages we could hear. He would point out English, Slavonian, Castilian Spanish, Italian, Chinese, and Japanese. My grandfather would identify the languages for me and have me listen to see if I could identify them too. To continue on this theme of diversity, this is a great photograph of Japanese and Croatian packers. This is 1911. And this is Mitchell Kalich right here. And he's holding the hands of his two children. This is Louis on the apple box. And Lucille has got his left hand. And we have a whole lot of, of Croatian packers and we have a whole load of young Japanese packers. And they're all working together. But I want to make a point about this. This, this wasn't just a working relationship. And the reason we know this, 34 years later, after this photograph was taken, during World War II, the Croatian Kalich family would travel all the way to Poston, Arizona, to visit the Japanese Yagi family at the internment camp where they had been relocated throughout the war. The Kalich family was also one of the Watsonville families who assisted their Japanese neighbors when they returned to the Pajaro Valley. So, who packed in the packing sheds? As Catherine said earlier, everyone did. When it was time to harvest the apples, everyone worked. Women, children, everyone. Everyone was participating. And in this, a great photograph of women here in, in, in the packing houses. This is 1904. And moving on just a little bit to cultural life in Watsonville, we're going to move forward in time a bit here. This is the, a photo of the Austri Austrian American Benevolent Society. It's 1922. And I want to remember, or have you remember, that at this point, Croatia is under the rule of Austria. And that's why they have the title, the Austrian American Benevolent Society. But I can assure you these are all Croatians here. <laughs> Benevolent societies were established in all Croatian communities in this country to care for the poor, the sick, and the dead. But they were also meeting places for business and the place where you found jobs. A branch of San Jose's society was first started in Watsonville in 1894, but Watsonville had its own started by 1898. Moving on, this is another packing house wedding. We, we love this photograph. This is the, uh, the wedding of Peter Stolich and Helen Pekarovich in 1914. And I don't know how well you can see, but way in the back there's also box, uh, uh, apple boxes stacked up in the back. But a couple of things I wanted to point out about this photograph, I want you to notice the Croatian um, needlework on the end of this tablecloth right here. And we have a Croatian tablecloth on the table with us, us up here this, this afternoon. Also, there are many bottles of wine. 
And we're assuming that that's homemade Croatian wine, because I don't think they'd be drinking anything else. Next one, this is a weekend gathering at the Visa's house on San Juan Road in the 1920s. And this just happens to be, Kathy's and my, this is our great uncle Andrew, right here, and our uncle Nick Korac, who is Nita Gizdic's father. And he's playing the guzla, which is a traditional stringed Croatian instrument. And this is John Visa right here. So this is, these kind of afternoon, weekend barbecues were happening all of the time. It was very much a part of their world. Another barbecue, this one shows a little more meat. <laughs> this is 1920s. Um, I don't think I need to say meat is the mainstay of Croatian food. This is probably goat or lamb, or it could be both. And I have to say, you won't find many Croatian vegetarians. Another barbecue, this one on Ford Street, 1928. This one is in the back of the Bubich House on Ford Street. And one of the unique, th unique things about this photograph is that all but three people in this photograph have been identified. We know who everybody is. And I do want to point out, this is my father, Andrew Mekas, right here. And this is his sister, Helen Estoya, who's here in the audience. And this is my, our, our uncle Nick, my dad's younger brother, and all three of them are here today. The next shot you're going to recognize, this is the Miramar Bar. It's at 526 Main Street. It opened in 1947 by three partners, Nick Derpich, Clem Ivlich, and Blondie Lusic. It was a Croatian hangout for more than 40 years, into the 1990s. And a shot of Blondie Lusic at the old Miramar Grill counter in 1947. And since we're sitting in the Henry Mello Center, we thought it would be appropriate to show you a photograph of former Senator Henry Mello. He's at the piano. He's playing with George Munkovich, who's at the drums. They call themselves Two Tons of Rhythm. <laughs> in this photo, they're playing for drinks at the Croatian-owned Royal Bar and Grill at 414 Main Street. And no, Henry was not Croatian. He was one of, the, one of Watsonville's Portuguese, and that's another Watsonville story that needs to be told. Finally, we're going to bring this full circle. This is a shot of Croatian culture today. This is a photograph of Konavli women wearing full traditional dress. This photograph was taken last year in 2008 in the village of Chilipi. In closing this afternoon, the Croatians were one of the many immigrant groups who found a new life in America and have contributed to our nation's growth. In the Pajaro Valley, it has been the mixture of all of the immigrant groups that have made this valley so rich. This story is one more piece of cloth in this richly textured quilt we call the Pajaro Valley. If you want to know the rest of the story, we'll meet you in the lobby and sign a book. Puno Fala. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>